least it's morning somewhere. I left San Francisco on Monday, arrived here Wednesday. I don't know what happened to Tuesday. It sort of evaporated. <clears throat> I guess as a bonus, I do get two Saturdays, so it all balances out in the end. Um, well, I'm Derek Giddos. For those of you who, who uh, haven't met me before, I'm the head of product strategy within Oracle supply chain product development team. So we are the folks who are responsible for uh, planning the roadmap for the transportation and global trade management products. Uh, I'm joined here at the conference with a couple of my colleagues from our development team, and they'll be, they have sessions, one later this afternoon and one tomorrow, talking about some of the latest features that we've brought out in our most current release. What I'm going to do here, however, uh, because my team is responsible for the roadmap, is spend most of the time talking about the future. And if you've ever been to any Oracle presentation that involves talking about the roadmap, uh, you'll see one of these slides. I've, I've memorized it verbatim, so I don't need to look at it. Uh, basically, it just says that you know roadmap plans are, are subject to change. Before I, I get into the roadmap, however, I'm going to begin with a little kind of update on where the product is. I know most of the people uh, here in the room are quite, quite familiar with the transportation management product, but maybe some of you are not uh, are, are new to it. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes just kind of talking about where we are. Uh, I always like to say that if you're going to plan a roadmap and figure out, you know, how to get to your destination, you sort of need to know where you're currently at if you're going to put that plan together. So I'll spend, spend a few minutes sort of laying the current state out for you. Uh, and then the bulk of my presentation will be talking about the product roadmap. I'm not going to cover every single thing we've, we are working on. I've kind of organized it around four different uh, major themes. Uh, and these are all areas that are either uh, planned to come out in the next release, and I'll kind of mention those specifically, or they are items we're working on in the, in the medium term for delivery over the next you know, two, three, uh, four years. Uh, then I've got some development updates. So these would be the kinds of topics that my colleague uh, Jim Mooney would, uh, would normally cover. But since he's uh, not here today, I will, I will do that in his place. And if there are any you know, uh, spare time left, which will be a challenge because I have a lot of content to cover and I speak fast, but not that fast, uh, I will cut, take questions at the end. Um, Lorenz has already threatened me that if I go five seconds over, he's going to zap me with a taser that he's got sitting on a table in front of him. Uh, so I'll try to stick to the time. But if you do have questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be here for the duration of the conference all day today and, and uh, tomorrow as well. All right, so let's begin uh, sort of where we are with the current state of, state of affairs. For Oracle, our uh, 2016 already came to an end. Um, so from a fiscal perspective, we're already into, it's already a new year, started a few months back. Um, so in terms of, you know, how that year, look, looking back from our perspective, uh, it was a very, very, just a very positive year in, in many regards. So one, I'm going to talk about cloud. Now, I know cloud is, is one of those, you know, certainly overhyped words, I would say, and, and coming from San Francisco, coming from Silicon Valley, which is the center of the universe from which all hype originates, uh, there is certainly, you know, uh, some hype to it. But with that said, uh, it, it is very, at the same time, very real. Uh, and we have definitely seen a marked shift uh, in what our customers, as our new customers are, are buying the product for the very first time, the vast, vast majority of them are choosing a cloud implementation. And many customers who have been, some of you maybe even in this room, who have been customers for a long time are looking at, rather than do an upgrade to your on-premise deployment, more and more customers are looking at making a switch instead of upgrading, doing a migration to the cloud version. Uh, and I won't go into all the details of you know, why, but, but at the end of the day, it's basically because it's a better way to use software. It's a better way for us. It's easier for us to develop it and maintain it, uh, and it's easier easier for customers to deploy and operate. So it's a real strong win-win. Uh, we saw record growth in, in, in 2016. And that's quite substantial because 2015 was our best year on record. Uh, and we were already doing very well before that. So thanks to our uh, cloud uh, deployment, uh, the number of new customers that we're adding to our customer base on an annual basis has nearly tripled over the last two years. So, very substantial growth that we're seeing. 
Uh, and we're also seeing you know, great success. By success, I mean customers who are not just purchasing the product, but are deploying the product, getting value from the product. And, and of course, that's one of the reasons you come to these events is to hear some of those stories, uh, to learn you know, what challenges customers face and what they did to overcome them. And we are definitely seeing an acceleration of customers being able to go live faster. Um, you know, we track every quarter. We keep track of you know who, who the new customers are, and we tr also try to keep track of you know which customers have uh, gone live for the first time. Uh, and usually, the lag between buying software and going live with software, you know, if that if that happened six months apart, that that was that was pretty fast. Uh, and we're now seeing situations where customers are buying it in the one, in a quarter and going live in the same quarter, so in in twelve weeks or less. Um, every software company on the planet says they're a leader, uh, so of course I have to say that we're a leader, um, although I'm, I'm an engineer by training, so I actually like to back that up with quantitative facts. So we work with uh, different industry analyst firms who measure market share, so when I say we're the leader, we are a leader in terms of market share. Uh, we have 19% of the total market, so of all the money spent in the world on transportation management software, about 19% of it goes to Oracle. And that's the number one position. Uh, number two is a company called SAP at 12%, and number three is a company called JDA at 6%. So we are more than number two and number three put together. Uh, and of course, the reason I mention that isn't just because it's a kind of point of pride. Uh, we, it's important because that is the fuel that drives the innovation in the product. So. The more growth we have, the more customers we have, the more resources we have to feed the development machinery to keep putting out new releases and new capabilities that ultimately gives you more value. And that's what we've been doing. So 641, that, that version came out last year, about 12 months ago, uh, and we're just about ready to release the next version. Um, and that's a lot of what I'll be talking about as I get to the next part of this presentation. Yeah, this is, this is my old school watch. Got to even wind it. Um, but I do got the digital version there, just in case. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, cloud is we, we've seen the shift, and it's not again not just marketing hype and hyperbole. Uh, so in the course of launching this uh, cloud option, which we we announced uh, two years ago, uh, and then we started actually deploying the very first cloud customers in uh, February of 2015. So it's about a year and a half, coming up on two years now of experience. Uh, and by the end of August of just this past year, we had over 160 customers worldwide across 30 different countries, 16 different industries. Uh, and that's pretty substantial. You know, if, if the, for those of you who know the history of the product, it was acquired from a company called G-Log back in 2005. Uh, the company started in 1999. When we acquired them in 2005, they had about 45 customers. So in the first six years, they, got, they grew to 45 customers. In the last year and a half, we've added over 160 from a cloud perspective. So very, very uh, rapid, rapid growth. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, uh, you know, is we have a very strong partner community. As the slide mentioned, there's over 20 partners who have validated cloud implementation programs. All the partners who are here at the event have that. Uh, and they mentioned it, uh, the first two presenters mentioned it a little bit. Uh, but we do have a fairly rigorous process that we put partners through to, to validate that they have programs and the wherewithal to, to deliver uh, a strong cloud implementation. And it's really a global product. So uh, as sort of you know, our regional, our multiple user group conferences that we have, the, the one here in, in, in Singapore for the uh, Asia Pacific community, the one we have coming up in Amsterdam for, for Europe, and of course in Philadelphia for, for the North American customer base sort of you know, uh, testifies to that. Uh, but by the numbers over the last um, several years now, uh, in fact, last year, I think for the first time, more than 50% of our new customers came from outside of North America. So it's very much a global product in the sense of customers who are using it around the world and customers who are buying it all around the world. It's also good for me because every year I, I update this slide. I, I, I've used it for I don't know how many years now, so I do actually add new flag 
logo icons to it every, every year. So for, for extra bonus points, if someone can tell me the new flags that I had this year compared to last year, I'll give you a special prize. All right. Uh, so besides measuring market share, we also measure how we're viewed in the Magic Quadrant. As we're familiar with uh, the analyst firm Gartner, they produce Magic Quadrants for different categories of software. For transportation, they've been producing this Magic Quadrant report. So it's, there's a full report behind this, not just a graphic. Uh, since 2006, we've been in the Leaders Quadrant every year. Uh, this is the 2016 version. I expect an updated one will come out probably about you know March or so of 2017. Uh, and it's really ultimately our job and my, my team to make sure we stay there in that, in that leader's position. We can all think of examples of technologies or companies or products that were category leaders only to, in some cases, get left behind or in some cases go extinct because you sort of lose focus or don't keep up with the changing uh, technology or changing kind of requirements of your customer base. So we're very proud of the fact that we're in that leader's position, uh, but it's also motivation for us to maintain that leadership position, both in terms of the capabilities that the product delivers today and also the work that we're doing to make sure that we are in that leader's position for you for the next, next year, the next three years, the next five, the next ten, uh, for forever. All right, so that's where we are presently. Now let's, now let's turn our attention to the future. Um, we're on a cadence now, roughly speaking, of producing one new release every 12 months. And so version 6.4.1, that is the current generally available version. So if you were to download the software and you know, if you were to buy a license or download the software, that's the version you'd be using. If you were to purchase a cloud subscription, that's the version that would be provisioned for you. Um, the next version is 642. As, as I mentioned, we produce them every, about every 12 months. 641 came out in December of 2015. Some fairly basic arithmetic will tell you when the next version will be coming out, even though I cannot tell you when. Uh, 643 is the version after that. Again, another 12 months, so you can kind of get a sense for when these versions are coming out. Um, a lot of the features that I will be talking about in the subsequent slides, a number of them are capabilities that are coming out, are planned to come out in, in 642. Some others are longer term, and I'll, and I'll try to make reference to you know, what's planned for the next release versus what's uh, further out as, as I go through them. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about well, quite a few new capabilities that we have on our roadmap, and I've categorized them into four, four buckets, uh, cloud-related, user experience, innovation, and depth. So in the innovation area, this is about adding really brand new business process support. So adding features for business functionality that we don't support at all today. Uh, depth is going to be about features or, or business functions that we support already in the current version, uh, but we're extending, kind of extending the, the, the feature set. User experience is really all about the user interface, how you uh, interact and utilize the software. Uh, and there'll be a fair amount more on the user experience work uh, tomorrow when, when my colleague Mutu is up here uh, in his session. So let's begin with cloud. All right, so a few things uh, that I wanted to mention. Now, we, as, as I said, we have launched the cloud product. We have customers who are using We have customers here who will be talking about it. Uh, so what are we doing from a roadmap perspective? Well, a few things. Um, one of the most important is that in our next release, we're uh, going to be able to support the full range of scalability capabilities that the product has. Uh, OTM is very scalable for those of you who have been around the product for a while you know the scalability features and kind of how you can expand uh, the product from a capacity perspective to handle you know large amounts of data processing or, or big bulk plans um, when we first started deploying for our cloud customers we I would say we have we certainly have scalability um, but it would handle anywhere from what I'll call a small size customer to what I would call a large customer by large, I would mean if you're doing more than 10,000, 15,000, maybe 20,000 orders and shipments a day. 
and that's good for about 90 to 95 percent of the companies out there. But for that sort of top top five percent who need that extra level of of scalability, um, we did not have that sort of full full range. Uh, so that's going to be addressed in the in the next cloud uh, version. Um, also, uh, archiving. Right? So we have customers who want to know, okay, we're putting all of our data in, in the cloud, and we understand that it's our data, you know, it's ours to use. Uh, but but how, how much can we keep there? So we're, we're implementing a program that will allow you to maintain up to 10 years of data in our cloud system. In a, um, roughly been two years will be sort of live uh, transactional data. By transactional, I mean you can, you can view it, you can act on it. It's you know, shipments, orders, invoices, trade transactions, all those sorts of things. Uh, after a certain period of time, that, that transactional data will get moved over into an archived schema. So it's still available f for you as, as users. You can log in and you can view the information, but you can't do anything with it. So uh, it's really there for audit purposes if you ever need to go back and look at an invoice, look at a shipment, look at a trade transaction type of thing. Um, the other... Um, small bullet point, uh, but very critical one there, is about zero or, or minimal downtime for patching and upgrades. Uh, the Oracle Cloud Transportation Global Trade Management has a standard service level availability of 99.5%. So that means, you know, anytime you go to log in and go to use the application, it should be up and available for you 99.5% of the time. Uh, and then there's a small asterisk, you know, beside that number. Uh, and that 99.5 does not include time when it's planned to be unavailable for maintenance activity. So that maintenance activity might be the quarterly patching that we do, or it might be when it's um, unavailable because it's go you're going through a, a, an upgrade cycle. And that's very standard. That's sort of standard software industry um, service level agreement definition, so whether it's 99.5 or 99.9, .9, no one counts the planned downtime uh, against that number. So what we're doing, because um, of course nobody wants any downtime at all, uh, is we are implementing uh, features that will allow us to perform what we refer to as hot patching. That means when instead of um, taking the system down, which we do right now, once a quarter for up to, I think it's up to 10 or 12 hours maximum, for patching, we will try to bring that number down to near zero. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll ever reach zero, but we want to get it down to a point where it is, uh, you know, a very very short uh, duration, uh, and ultimately have it to the point where where we can even do the upgrade itself with near zero downtime. So we're going to start with the uh, near zero downtime for the patching. That's that's planned for our 643 version, uh, and then be able to do. Um, near zero downtime for upgrades in the version after that. The other two items, extensibility and integration, I have slides for, so I'll kind of move ahead and talk to those. Uh, one of the concerns a lot of companies have uh, if they're looking at deploying a cloud application, a, a true software as a service application, is that you can't customize. So you cannot get into the innards of the software, you cannot access the database directly, you cannot make modifications to the data schema, you cannot add and modify the source code. That's just sort of the way software as a service applications work. However, there's still, in many cases, a valid need uh, to make modifications to the software or make extensions to the software to meet business requirements. So our strategy is twofold. One, we want to make sure our product is as flexible as possible. That means, you know, having features in the software that you can configure. So I can configure the user interface. I can configure reports. I can configure parameters in my trade transaction uh, rules engine. I can, you know, configure rates for OTM uh, freight costing. Uh, but if you need to go beyond that, then we have a set of technologies that we refer to as platform as a service or PaaS. And these are a set of technologies that Oracle offers. They're also cloud-based, and they really enable customers to do three things. Um, they enable you, first and foremost, to build your own custom applications, run those applications in the same Oracle cloud that, say, transportation and global trade is running, and have those custom applications talk to 
or tie into your, in this case, transportation product and act as an extension. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a moment. Uh, the other things that platform as a service kind of enable you to do is one, you can develop, in, uh, so we talked about uh, customizations. Two, you can develop integrations. So if you have your own software, so you have to integrate with financials for freight payment or your uh, ERP system to get your sales orders for transportation planning. So you can develop integrations, and I'll talk more about that. And then thirdly, we have partners, so third-party, you know, independent software vendors who are developing applications that will also run on the Oracle Cloud. So we have what's referred to as the Oracle Cloud Marketplace, where again, you can access software, complementary software, and run that in the same Oracle Cloud and, and tie it in with, in this case, transportation and global trade. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the practicalities, uh, I think this is the most technical slide that I have, uh, on kind of how you can extend the application using platform as a service. Uh, and I think this is also the one slide I have that is not talking about a roadmap. So the feature I'm describing here is available today. Um, and what we did, um, in, so it's available in 641, is we developed a set of what are referred to as REST web services. You know, I actually had to look up what REST meant because I kept using it in presentations and I didn't actually know, know what it meant. Any, anybody know what REST actually stands for? This is a, this is a nerd quiz. Anyone? Anyone? It stands for Representational State Transfer. I don't really know why that's relevant, but I just felt I had to figure out what REST meant in case anybody asks. Uh, the important thing about REST web services is that they are, they enable you to access the system in a very granular way. So typically, the integrations or the interfaces we have today, they're very good for loading data into OTM or getting data out. So you have a bunch of orders from your ERP system. You want to load those orders into OTM. You have uh, orders. You want to screen for trade compliance purposes. You can lo load them into OTM. You want to get planned shipments out of OTM and feed them into your warehouse management system. So. Those interfaces we've had for a long time, very robust, do all kinds of wonderful things. But if you want to build custom add-on applications, those interfaces are a little too heavy for that purpose. REST-based web services are designed for that. In fact, the mobile application that our, that our product has, that mobile application was built using these same REST services. So if you want to build customizations, you want to build your own user interfaces, you want to build custom logic that ties into and accesses an OTM shipment or a trade transaction in global trade or an invoice, you can use these REST services to do that. So that's one beauty of it. So it's good for consultants, good for building customizations. But it's better than traditional customizations because those interfaces are standard. And that means when we do an upgrade, any of those customizations you've built and have running in our platform as a service, they will continue to operate. Right? So they are upgrade proof so long as you're using our, our standard interfaces. All right, other things, integrations. Now, just because you go to cloud doesn't mean that you don't have to integrate. Uh, so all the typical integrations you would need to do in a transportation or global trade project are still the same. However, if you're going to run cloud software for transportation, um, maybe you, you know, um, also want to perform the integration using cloud software. So in Platform as a Service, we have an integration product called Integration Cloud Service, very imaginative name. Uh, and it enables you to build and deploy and monitor any integration with OTM or GTM or other Oracle Cloud applications as cloud software. So rather than having to buy and install middleware products to do that, you can do it using a cloud service. Uh, try to go one step further in that this, this tool set, if you're not familiar with it, is designed to make the process of building those integrations a little easier. I, I won't say it eliminates all the work. That'd be, that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, but with every Oracle Cloud product, it comes with what we refer to as an adapter. And that adapter sort of masks a lot of the complexity of what the actual uh, data interfaces look like and make it easier for you know, real human beings to build and deploy integrations. And then we're taking that one step further, which is we are delivering as samples 
uh, example maps and process flows that you can leverage. So obviously we're going to do that with other Oracle products. So if you want to use Oracle Transportation Management and have that tied in with Oracle's Order Management product, which is another product my team you know, is responsible for, not only will we have the integration cloud service adapters, we will actually have the process flows that you can leverage for that. Um, Integration cloud service is not just for Oracle products, however, they also have adapters for other third-party software products that, you know, may be produced by, you know, other software vendors that you, that you may be using. And indeed, even if you have legacy applications for which we would not be able to deliver an out-of-the-box adapter for, there is a toolkit to build adapters. So basically, if you have an application, if there's a way to get data in or out of it, uh, you can leverage ICS for it. All right, that's enough on integration. One last thing on platform as a service. Uh, so documents um, doesn't get a lot of fanfare, but one of the important sort of operational aspects of using a transportation management system or a global trade application is managing documents, uh, shipping documents, bills of lading, customs invoices, etc. cetera. Uh, so platform as a service has a tool for managing documents in the cloud. So you can store documents in OTM directly. You, know, you can produce a document, store it. You can upload a document and store it in OTM. But if you want to have an enterprise-wide document storage solution, so you're storing documents not just from OTM but other applications, um, our platform as a service tool uh, enables you to do that. And in our next release, we have an integration between OTM and GTM. So any documents stored here, you can access in, in our products. All right, so let's move on to topic number two, user experience. You have to say user experience because it sounds sassier than user interface, but that's at the end of the day really what it, what it is. So we have been working on enhancing our user interfaces uh, really over the last couple of years. It's been a, a major project uh, that's still well underway. Again, for those of you who have been with the product since the beginning, people like me, uh, the software originated in 1999. Uh, first version was released in the year 2000. I'm now of the, of the age where I think that's not all that long ago, but in, in reality, in particular in software years, uh, the year 2000 was a very long time ago. And to a large degree, our user interfaces, the design patterns uh, that are in the product until very recently really reflected those initial design patterns that we implemented in 2000, right? And they don't really sort of line up with the expectations that people have today. More importantly, they, they don't really provide the most productive way of using the software. So we have undertaken this very big project, it's both a technology project and a functional project. So from a technology perspective, we are want to leverage the same standard user interface tools that all the other Oracle products are. So if you're using, if you're not just a transportation or a global trade customer and you're using our financial products or sales and marketing products, the user interface would actually look and feel and operate kind of in the same way. Uh, and they're standard products, so in terms of being able to get training and know how to use them, um, they're standard as opposed to the proprietary tools that we had used beforehand. Okay? Uh, but the real reason for doing it is, of course, functional, because we want to make our product easier for people to learn, easier for people to use. And as I have said, I think on multiple occasions, uh, if we did nothing but improve the user experience of the product, we did a whole new release, didn't add a single feature, just improved the UI, all of you would think that we added a whole pile of new features to the product. Right? Simply because there's so much there that for many organizations, you know, it's like the uh, prior speakers, you know, un uh, kind of uncovering or unboxing the, the hidden value. All right, so what specifically are we doing? Now, uh, as I said, my, my, my colleague has a session coming up. Uh, one of my colleagues has a session coming up tomorrow. It's going to focus on some of the recent work we've done in the user experience realm, so I won't spend a whole lot of detail here. Uh, but just to give you a flavor of what's coming around the corner in 642, it's fairly radical change. This is what the product looks like today. This is the standard, unconfigured, out-of-the-box. You know, you log into OTM, you log into GTM. This is what you see blank left-hand side with a bunch of menu options. Of course, you can configure that, you know, define different user roles and, you know, constrain people to what menu uh, options they can, they can access. 
uh, in 642 it's going to look like that. Okay, so the menu is gone. Well, it's not really gone, and I'll show you in a moment where it, where it disappeared to. Uh, and this menu-based navigation structure has been replaced with a more contemporary icon-based. So this is referred to lovingly as the springboard. So those little icons there kind of take the place of the menu options that you would have normally seen. And of course, you can configure it. So just like on your you know, iPad, you know, you can configure how you place the icons. Every icon is either going to open up a group of icons or you're going to navigate directly to a particular user interface. So you're going to navigate to the shipment finder. You're going to navigate to, um, you know, the invoices, however you set those up, okay? Now, for those of you who are worried about where the menu went, it is still there. Uh, if you click on that little three horizontal bars, which kind of looks like the number three in Chinese, uh, but it actually is referred to as the hamburger. Uh, when you, I didn't make that up, it's called the hamburger. When you click on the hamburger, it'll pop up the full menu or the configured menu if you've gone ahead and, and made modifications to it. Right. There's a bunch of other changes associated with, with what the springboard brings, but I don't have enough sort of time to go through it all here, um, but it is coming. Uh, our other big area of investment, so the springboard is just sort of you know, it's navigation to a large extent. Uh, the other work that we're doing is really about, you know, when you're, when you're in the application, when you're doing your, your job day to day. And for that, we have uh, heavily invested and are building more out in what we refer to as our workbench concept. Uh, this started a couple of releases ago, um, and in 6.4.2, so just the release around the corner, it's expand, expanding greatly. Um, Anyone here use advanced uh, advanced layouts? Yeah, I see a few hands. Okay, so the workbench here is really the next generation of that, uh, and one of its distinct advantages over the older technology is it is much easier for a user to configure one of these workbenches. It actually comes with a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get editor. So you, as you're building your workbench, your personalized workbench, you can very easily see what that workbench will look like. Uh, and you don't need to be very you know, technical to actually do that configuration. So put more configuration capability in the hands of the end user. Uh, and we're expanding on this from a functional point of view. So basically what we have in the workbench is you can configure different regions or, and then a region could be a table, a region could be a geographical view where I'm looking at orders and shipments on a map, uh, a region could be a Gantt chart. Uh, and so we are extending this concept in a couple of different ways. First, we are adding support for all of the business objects or the vast, vast majority of the business objects in our product. So in the first version, it was really motivated by some of our customers who are using our fleet management product to dispatch you know, drivers and trucks. So we didn't support all of the entities. So initial versions supported orders and shipments, drivers. Uh, now coming up in 642, all of the business objects. So invoices, equipment, uh, global trade, trade transactions, really all the main business entities that you would want to see you can now create workbenches that access that information. We're also adding additional views. So as is illustrated here, we have a number of customers who are using our three-dimensional load planning capabilities. And so now you can view in one of those regional windows a three-dimensional, that three-dimensional rendering of the shipment. And this is actually done with a different technology than what we had used before. We had a product or a software component called Cortona, if I remember that correctly. You actually had to download it and do all that kind of business. Now you don't, don't need to do that. So one, you can view it with inside a workbench, and two, we've eliminated this sort of download and install problem. Okay. Um, we're also adding usability features. So the big one here is inline edits. So when you're looking at data in one of those tables, rather than have to open up a manager user interface and make, make an edit, you can make the edit directly from the table and adding additional features that allow you to set up and configure them. Okay. So copy an existing layout or take an existing layout and edit one of the, you know, uh, edit one of the regions. All right, and as I said, inline edits, it's kind of a, seems small, but it's a, it's a big productivity improver. All right, we also have maps. We've had the mapping feature now, uh, again, since the beginning. The key difference versus the traditional maps, for those of you who are familiar with it, is you, all the mapping 
is now done via real-time web service calls. So whether, whether you're an on-premise user or whether you're a cloud user, you no longer actually have to install any map data locally. OTM is calling out to either um, we have partnerships with uh, HERE, HERE.com, which is the current incarnation of the Navtech folks, um, kind of one of the, the leaders in the space for providing mapping data. And so we can make real-time calls to their mapping service and then render that map uh, accordingly. And we also support ALK, um, which is another software vendor in this space, uh, part of the Trimble um, Corporation, widely, particularly widely used within the uh, North American market. Okay, so the map is actually from, the, from, from those partners. You buy a subscription to their mapping services. You, you provide some parameters. It works inside the product. We also will be supporting uh, maps.oracle.com. That is the Oracle, cl uh, Oracle Cloud mapping service. It happens to use data from here.com. Uh, but one of the key differences, in, if you use the Oracle version and does come with some restrictions, is you don't have to pay additional money to use it. Um, the asterisk there is if you're using it for fleet purposes, then you then you need to pay something uh, additional. Otherwise, the mapping uh, is included with OTM. And we continue to do more functionally on top of the map. So we rely on the map vendors to show the map, show things like weather, accidents, etc. Uh, and then we add the features that allow you to do things like drag and drop, you know, move orders to shipments, move stops around from one shipment to another. So mapping is there. That's a current capability. Some of these new features, like the interactive dragging and dropping, that's what's planned for 6.4.2. Okay. Uh, in terms of mobile application, we have a mobile app. Uh, we delivered that 6.4.1. Um, and um, we have a number of customers who have already uh, taken use of it. Um, we continue to do more here. Um, so one of, one of the kind of key features for using the mobile app is for shipment visibility. Right? So you, you may be working with smaller you know, trucking companies. You know, it's a one-person trucking company. They, they don't have an IT department. They're not going to be able to send you shipment status information electronically. And you want to be able to give them the ability to interact with you to accept the shipments that have been assigned to them, provide shipment status updates. Um, so that's really the main use case that we are initially supporting. So one of those features includes getting GPS information from the phone itself. Right? So every one of those devices that we're all either got stuck in our pockets or are currently looking at while I'm talking um, can provide GPS coordinate data. Right? So no, no one's hidden. Um, right now, the feature requires that the driver or the, the user physically send the status update. Passive tracking means that if you enable that, we will collect the GPS coordinate information off the phone automatically without anybody doing anything. Um, store and forward, that's all about, you know, if you're out of sort of uh, service range, you want to be able to collect information on the phone and then sync it up when you get back into range. Uh, and then adding additional functions. So right now, as I said, it's really about for shipment tendering and assignments, uh, shipment visibility, shipment status updates, uh, proof of delivery capture. But there's more we can do. So dock appointment scheduling, uh, freight, freight invoice approvals. So those are all functional areas that we're looking to add. You can also modify the mobile application. So we, we ship you know, an out-of-the-box mobile app that you download from the Apple or Android uh, marketplaces, uh, and if you want to make extensions to that, you, you can do that too. All right, my last thing kind of in this category is something called the Oracle Social Network. It's a bit of a misnomer, I think. Uh, I wouldn't have given it that product name, but hey, I, not my product. So uh, what do you actually do with the Oracle Social Network? It is, it is designed as a communication tool, right? and what makes it I think intriguing from uh, our use case is that it helps users eliminate all the communication activity that they typically, at least for me anyway, I think about what I do in my day. Uh, you know, sort of half my time is spent, you know, on the phone and reading and writing emails and text and instant messaging. Just think of having that capability inside your business application. So there I am, uh, transportation dispatcher. I'm looking at an order that I can't find a sh I can't find a carrier for, or I'm looking at an invoice that I don't quite understand why I'm being billed for these charges. And if you want to have strike up a conversation, 
with either you know the guy in the in the warehouse who can't get the shipment loaded or with the carrier who sent you that invoice you can initiate that conversation using this embedded social network feature so as you're and that's what that little panel on the left hand side is it's the embedded oracle social network so was that <clears throat> while I'm looking at a shipment, while I'm looking at a trade transaction, while I'm looking at an invoice, I can begin to have basically sort of an instant messenger type conversation relative to it with any of the involved parties on that transaction. So that could be other OTM users, so other people in your organization who have access to OTM, or it could be external users. So it uses the same security model. In other words, if that person, that party has access to that data, then they can see it. If they are not a direct user of the application, so you don't want to give them you know, a, a direct login, Oracle Social Network also comes with its own mobile app and its own uh, browser-based app, so they can access their conversations that way. And because it's part embedded in the application, all of that communication history uh, is all tracked and recorded and auditable. So again, try to, make, try, try to streamline conversations and communications while enforcing, you know, sort of enterprise, you know, security and kind of compliance requirements. Uh, this, although the springboard is planned for 642, the embedding the Oracle social network is, is planned for 643. All right, a couple more categories. So innovation. As I, as I mentioned before, innovation is about adding support for whole brand new areas of the product that we don't really support today. And the first one I wanted to talk about is something called transportation brokerage. And I'm going to begin with a bit of a discussion. So it's just what is you know, brokerage? All right. Forget about the word brokerage. The actual business case here is that, of course, for most organizations, you have contracts in place with transportation providers where you have pre-negotiated the rate. So it's going to be so many euros per kilometer. It's going to be so many Singapore dollars per container. Uh, and that contract may also include some definition of what kind of capacity is commit, committed. So that rate is good for so many TEUs on this lane or so many tons. Um, what can happen, however, is the amount of stuff you actually need to ship goes beyond what you have contracted capacity available. And when that happens, organizations go out to the spot market. They work with brokers. They work with uh, sometimes referred to as load boards. These are online marketplaces where you can post available freight. So these are shipments I need to have moved. And these marketplaces will help marry that up with capacity that different transportation providers have to move it. And you have a negotiation and you get it moved using whatever kind of spot rate you can you can get for that for those goods. The feature here that we're working on, multiple features actually, so one is making it easier for you as an OTM user to automatically, if you have shipments that you can't move doing, using your normal contract capacity, it will have the ability to integrate to and post those shipments into these different online marketplaces. In fact, we have one uh, such marketplace that's already built an integration to us uh, to, to do this very function. So it's, it's even possible today, just we're, we're going to work on making that easier. And provide support for multiple marketplaces. So you're there using Oracle Transportation Management, you want to be able to publish your shipment out to multiple marketplaces, be able to do that, and be able to manage the interaction with those marketplaces, with those load boards, as they're sometimes referred to, in terms of getting the information back, okay, which carrier, which transportation service provider is actually going to get the work, uh, at what price, uh, and additional information that these uh, marketplaces provide. For example, some of them provide, you know, trends, reports on kind of what the average, you know, cost for shipments are in different, in different lanes for different types of equipment and, and so on. So that's one use case. The second use case is that for some of our larger customers, particularly some of our logistics service providers, our 3PL customers, and some of our bigger, I'll call shippers, who have multiple divisions all using OTM, some of them, those folks want to set up their own internal load board. So this is the ability to share either freight that needs to be moved or capacity that's available within an organization using OTM where you have multiple divisions or multiple business units using the product. And then the last use case here is, of course, we do have many logistics service providers. 
uh, using our product. And for them, not only do they need to interact with these online marketplaces, but they sometimes are the online marketplace. They are acting as brokers. So they need the ability to take orders, to quote uh, what, it, you know, what it would take to, to move that shipment on behalf of you as a, as a shipper and support not just the marrying up freight with capacity, but also the selling of those brokerage services. So this is a big project for us. Uh, and one that we'll be tackling over the next uh, over the next couple of years. All right, another big one for us in the transportation realm is we want to expand kind of our footprint from a planning perspective and support oper uh, move beyond our operational planning traditional domain into more tactical and strategic network planning. Right, so OTM is very good today at looking at shipments in the short term. You know, these are all the orders you need to move today, tomorrow, this week. What's the best way to, to move them? What's the best route? What's the right, what kind of equipment do I need? But if you want to do longer term planning, if you want to do simulations, you want to look at different what if type scenarios, you know, what if I shifted my freight through this gateway port to this other gateway port? You can do a little bit of that in OTM today, but it's not really designed uh, to handle that, that kind of use case. Um, so we're looking to expand the footprint and, again, provide that type of tactical uh, and strategic network planning. For those of you, again, who have followed our product for a while, we actually did have available for a while a product called the Logistics Command Center, which did this very thing. Um, however, that product came with a very heavy hardware footprint. You needed to use the Oracle Exadata uh, hardware platform, which is a great hardware platform, but it's sort of a, an expensive platform. Um, so uh, we, we sort of stopped with that product because in, in the interim, of course, what's happened is we've had this shift to cloud. So all of our cloud applications, OTM included, they actually run on Oracle Exadata servers. So you don't necessarily need to know that. Since it's cloud, it's all kind of hidden from you. But on the back end, it's actually running on Oracle Exadata. So now we have the opportunity to kind of bring back these logistics command center features without the overhead or additional expense of you having to invest and purchasing uh, the Exadata hardware to make that happen. All right, and then I also want to talk a little bit about global trade uh, and the innovations we've got going on there. Um, kind of a, again, it's a very, very strong product, um, but one of the areas we want to enhance is our support for free trade agreements. Again, if you're doing it's more prevalent in, in some industries, more, more so than others, but in, in many cases, um, products that you be buying from a supplier in one, you know, one country may qualify uh, for a given free trade agreement, which allows you to import that product at either a substantially reduced or sometimes zero a duty rate. Okay? Uh, but in order to take advantage of those free trade agreements, there's a few things you need to do, and so we're going to be supporting um, those those features. One is around uh, item eligibility. So looking at the free trade agreements, the rules around those agreements, and say, hey, this, this product, this clicker, um, if I buy it from this supplier in this country, it is eligible for preferential treatment. So rather than paying the standard, I don't know, 20% duty, I can bring them in and pay only 5%. But in order to get that preferential duty, I need my, that supplier to provide me certain documentation. They need to provide uh, certificates say, as an example. So that's part of what's called campaign management. That's going out once you've decided I'm going to buy this product from this supplier, it, it qualifies for this free trade agreement, I now need that supplier to provide the documentation. And you may need to maintain that documentation over some period of time. So you've got a certificate, it's valid for a year, you've got a long-term sourcing arrangement, the following year you need to know, hey, that, that, that certificate's going to expire, I need to go out and get a new one. And then when you actually produce the filings with customs, uh, you need to be able to produce the information to, you know, demonstrate why you're only paying the, you know, the 5% you know, instead of the 20 okay. So that's a big kind of area of innovation for us on the global trade front. And then lastly, in my 10 minutes and 53 seconds, a little bit on what we're doing to add depth into the product. So fleet, fleet, for all of you folks out there who own and operate your own fleet, you have your own drivers, your own trucks, your own trailers, containers, uh, about one in four, about 25% of our customer base is, uses the fleet management product. We continue to enhance it. Um, 
One area of enhancement is around user experience. So I've kind of already talked about that in general. Uh, what I'll highlight here is what we're doing in the area of fleet optimization in something that we call fleet aware planning. What is fleet aware planning? Fleet aware planning is as we are optimizing orders into shipments, we are building those shipments aware of the constraints and availability of the actual fleet resources to do the work. Right? Doesn't sound like much, but the big difference here is, is that in traditional approaches, you would sort of take orders, you build them up into shipments, like I can consolidate these orders together and I can put them on this route with these stops. And then you go to assign a driver and it's like, oh, I, I don't have enough drivers available to do that work. Or this route takes, uh, you know, eight hours to complete and I don't, I've got drivers available but none of them have enough hours of service left on their clocks to actually do the work. So fleet aware planning helps us produce a better result by looking at the details of what's available in the fleet in terms of what drivers, what capacity is available so that we're producing better, more executable plans in the first place, right? So fairly substantial from a, a potential benefit delivery perspective. Uh, and then doc scheduling. Doc scheduling is the area of the product we've had around for quite some time, over, over 10 years. Uh, it's fairly widely used. Um, seems like, for example, I think almost all of our consumer goods, uh, food, food product companies uh, like using doc scheduling. Uh, but it's another one of these areas where it could use some, uh, use some enhancement, I would say, from a user experience point of view. So one of the new workbenches that we have in the works is in the doc scheduling realm. So this is... Uh, and a plan for the 643 time frame. So a workbench that's dedicated to the doc scheduling process. Um, so make that process easier for the different types of people who use doc scheduling. I say different types of people. And some, of, some of the users may be your own folks. You may have people who are managing the docs for multiple facilities. Uh, and some of the users may be the, you know, the carriers or the suppliers, the people who are actually need to schedule their particular appointment as opposed to the per person who's responsible for the facility as a whole. And those are very different use cases, and we're looking at you know, how we support both of them uh, as we enhance the, enhance the doc scheduling product. Uh, and then a little bit on global trade in terms of adding depth. We have customs management capability. That's a, that's a current uh, set of features that we support. Uh, in 6.4.2, we're enhancing that uh, in significantly. One is by adding support for what we're referring to as declarations. So you can support different, multiple direct, de can't speak, declaration types, import, export, transit declarations, uh, and all of the sort of logic for how you map a trade transaction to a declaration. Uh, a trade transaction, if you're not familiar with that, that's how we model sales orders, purchase orders, the goods that are being imported or exported. And so I can map one trade transaction, could be part of one or many declarations. Likewise, a single declaration may map back to one or more trade transactions. Uh, and then we're also enhancing the actual sort of connectivity architecture. So we partner, uh, one of your options for doing the customs filings is you can partner with a company like Descartes, who we work with closely. So you can produce the information that customs needs uh, needs out of GTM, pass that information over to Descartes and leverage their global logistics network to handle sort of the last mile filing. Uh, and we've been working with them, making sure that we in particular have support for a lot of the uh, European filing requirements. Or you can do self-filing and we have customers particularly who are doing self-filing for uh, US purposes. Um, or you can use the, use the features to prepare the information, send it to your customs broker, and then have your customs broker uh, file on your behalf. All right, and because I got tired of talking about transportation and global trade, I thought I'd throw in a little bit about warehouse management. Um, you, may, you may have heard, uh, we made an announcement back in September that we uh, announced that we were going to acquire a company called Logfire, which is a provider of cloud-based warehouse management software. And now some of you are scratching your heads going, why is he talking about warehouse management software? Uh, the reason I'm mentioning it in this form is because this development team and this product will be merged into our product development team. So the folks who have been responsible for transportation and global trade will now be the team responsible for Oracle's warehouse management cloud product uh, as well. And that means we'll be working on features like developing an integrated logistics platform combining 
transportation and warehousing functions uh, in, a, in a tighter way than we could as sort of separate, you know, standalone uh, entities. So more, more to come on that front. Okay, and then in my last few minutes, I'll do my best Jim Mooney impersonation. Although I can't do him justice on his knowledge of Philadelphia. Uh, all right, so a few things here. One, uh, about six, so for current customers, talk about roll-ups. Uh, when we launched the 6-4 family, we changed our roll-up policy. We were doing roll-ups like once every quarter, once every four months. That turned out to be way too frequent because no one ever took them. Uh, so we changed that to a annual basis. So you had 6-4, 6 640, you have 641 that came out in December of last year, 642 for just around the corner, 643, okay? Uh, and these, unlike the older style roll-ups, th these I consider to be, you know, they're, they're the equivalent really of new releases. There's a lot of feature and function uh, added in them. Um, as far as if you have issues and you come to us and you want to get that issue patched, we have some policies around kind of what, how many versions will go back, so it's just the current and the one prior. That's kind of the, the primary uh, policy. And we also make these features uh, incremental in the sense that if you don't want to use the new capability, you, you sort of have to opt in. You, there are parameters that you can turn on or off, as the case might be, and by default, everything should be turned off. So it should make it easier for you to apply the roll-ups without you know, sort of disrupting your, your um, environment. Of course, if you're a cloud customer, this is all the moot point because we do all of this for you and you don't need to worry about it. Uh, likewise, if you're a cloud customer, you don't need to worry about the information on this slide, which is the support policy for the different versions that are out there. Um, if you're on version 5.5, I want to shake your hand later because you've been on a version that's very, very old. Um, some of these versions, so just if you're not already familiar, we have premier support. That's sort of the standard kind of for five years is the typical time frame. You have issues called Oracle support. You have bugs. We fix them. We, we give them patches. That goes for five years. You want to extend that for, I think, up to another three. That's called extended support. You pay a little bit more money, and we give you the same level of service for three more years. Once that runs out, then you're... Uh, then we're into, we will take your phone calls and provide emotional support. Uh, but, you know, we have very, very friendly counselor type people who will, who will talk, talk to you. Uh, but our ability to actually fix it is sort of, you know, non-existent. All right. So definitely want to know when those extended support dates are coming up on you. All right. Uh, again, if you've been a customer for a while, you, you have memorized this number. This is m the My Oracle support note. Um, and it's sort of the, the mother uh, support document uh, where we put all of our product documentation and training material. So this is one you want to save, and that's kind of how you access it. What I wanted to highlight here, however, is that we, are, you know, we do continue to look at how we can enhance the product information, the product documentation. So we've now started to add product demonstrations. So in addition to the sort of traditional transfer of information, those TOIs as we refer to, which are sort of the PowerPoint, you know, recorded by one of our product managers or development managers that you can replay. Um, these are actual software demonstrations that you can replay. And so, for example, those workbench, the workbench features I spoke about earlier, we have product demonstrations in this, uh, you can access via this support note. I'll actually walk through a demo of how you, you know, set up and, and use the workbenches. And we'll continue to kind of leverage this approach for uh, providing information on new features uh, going forward. Uh, likewise, I want to highlight this uh, docs.oracle.com site. So again, as we've, uh, on our journey in supporting cloud implementations and, and cloud customers, we've also try to make it easier to access uh, product documentation. So not everything necessarily through that My Oracle support note. And so if you're not already familiar with it, I would, again, this is another website to bookmark docs.oracle.com. And I haven't actually said it, but I'll, I will say it because I forgot. Um, when I talk about cloud or on-premise, it's important to know it's the same software. Right? So if you're using OTM 641 on-premise or in the cloud, it's the same product, it's the same feature. So even though this this document website kind of is cloud-centric, 
the documentation describing the capabilities or how to use it, it applies equally uh, regardless of how you've actually deployed the software. That takes me to the end. I have 22 seconds left. Um, so I just want to say, just reiterate the fact that please fill out the development survey. We do look at every single one of those survey responses. They do actually make a difference. Um, so please, before you uh, finish uh, the conference, please complete the survey, turn it in. There's a box at, out at the registration desk to collect them. And then on Friday, we'll have a little raffle and we have a small token of appreciation prize that we'll be giving out for, for, one, of, for one of you who've completed it. All right, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>